thanks a lot thank you i think let's go to the topic and spend little more useful time there thanks a lot ajay manoj your dream of having chawlas and chawlas what i i'm not uh-huh. on facebook but i i just uh, read those comments chawlas and chawlas being uh, moderated by guptas and gupta it will be gupta <laughs> and uh, Ruto Thakur, so that hasn't come true. Thank you. But for me, it's dream coming true that I'm I'm going to be a co-speaker with a star speaker like Manoj Chawla. Thank you. So let me share my screen here. Someone is still sharing the screen. Let me share. Yeah. am i visible my screen and slides yes sir, yes, sir. very much sir okay thank you so well this is going to be a uh, sponsored session by no nordis me and manoj will take you through what i have been asked to do is just discuss briefly what is science behind obesity it seems to be like uh, a layman teaching what we do to our third year students or to final year students that whenever you talk about obesity let me take you give you the overview i'll be discussing physiology of weight regulation then coming about etiopathogenesis of obesity and toward then i'll discuss benefits of weight loss which are so apparent but problem is that how to avoid that regain of weight which is a real concern so let me start with physiology of weight gain it was very very simple thing in layman terms that when we talk about weight regulation it is something to do with energy balance equation where intake has to match expenditure moment intake is more and expenditure is less obviously we will end up with obesity so intake is about management of hunger management of satiety and the nutrient absorption which happens which then obviously has to be burnt in form of calories to metabolic rate to thermogenesis to a structured exercise program and to a non exercise activity based thermogenesis so body weight is obviously going to be determined by an by an energy balance which is a u balance whether food intake should not be much or we need to burn more calories we need to have energy expenditure a good basal as well as exercise induced thermogenesis so as to make sure that there is not going to be a weight gain so when we talk about energy expenditure i think it is important to understand that physical activity in any form is going to lead on to some amount of expenditure energy expenditure whether it is a structured exercise which refers to amount of energy utilized during structured exercise like occupational physical activity commuting activity or even household works also involve lot of exercise once it is neat which is a non exercise activity thermogenesis which refers to amount of energy utilized spontaneously coming as a result of like muscle tone posture or balance so even if you are standing i think that also amounts to significant amount of expend expenditure of energy through neat which is non exercise activity thermogenesis and when we are talking of a diet induced thermogenesis this is something new which refers to heat production in response to food also which we never knew earlier days the amount of energy required for digestion absorption transportation and subsequent storage of even ingested nutrients so even that also needs to be metabolized and there is going to be some amount of diet induced thermogenesis and of course the basal metabolic rate is very very important which refers to energy required to sustain all essential physiological functions also so let's see how hormones and peptide they are involved in appetite regulation and how unfortunately still obesity happens in spite of a good balance or imbalance which happens leading on to obesity once it comes to central location hypothalamus it is a hypothalamus which is a principal organ which decides whether you are going to have a obesity or a balance it depends on anorexic genic hormones like pomc which is the most important it is a precursor protein actually proprio melanocortin pomc which produces many biological active peptides like melanocyte stimulating hormones alpha beta ms msh and even corticotrophin acth and beta endorphins also then you have nesfestin which is not all that important trh crh oxytocin is very very important 
serotonin and we always knew plays a huge role as an anorexigenic hormone and histamine also once it comes to orexigenic hormones which have an impact on hypothalamus it is principally neuropeptide 5 or agotic related protein which are very very important and even endocannabinoids are very very important you remember a drug which was endocannabinoid inhibitor rimonabant which of course was withdrawn because of psychiatric uh, insults or high rates of suicide but that was that way a good drug because it was uh, possible to have some weight loss on that drug once it is peripheral peptides and hormones it is ckk coming from the gastrointestinal tract which is very very cholecystokinin which is very very important glp1 we all know that is how we are using drugs like glp1 receptor agonist which is principally working as an anorexigenic hormone pancreatic polypeptide is also important oxynotrone modulin is also very very important but once it comes to orexigenic hormone from the gut it is ghrelin which plays an important role and that actually contributes towards obesity because it significantly increases the appetite in a person of course pancreatic peptides amylin and insulin also are very very important so i think it is very important to see that an appetite regulation these peripheral signals they modulate appetite and energy expenditure via hypothalamic neurons so arcuate nucleus are very very important first order neurons especially the medial arcuate nucleus which gets addressed with pomc and cart hormone and you have obviously then coming off satiety through stimulation of these pomc like hormones but once it comes to satiety peptides i told you pyy glp1 pp or oxynotomodulin are very very important and they played a very very important role in getting that satiety effect but once it is about hunger signals i told you ghrelin is very very important and it is primarily working through lateral arcuate nucleus and then it addresses the hunger center into the hypothalamus increasing the appetite so increasing predisposition to weight gain or obesity so adiposity signals like leptin and insulin are also very very important and even vagus plays a very important role all vagal efferent stimulations to nucleus uh, tractus solitarius also are going to go to brain stem and ultimately lead on to uh, increase in guessing emptying time that is how there is a reduction in appetite and of course feeding behavior changes because we have a sort of full stomach in spite of not having eaten for many hours and of course the statiny peptide like amylin and glp1 also work through area postrema and then try to reduce gastric motility and delay gastric emptying time which is a principal action of glp1 uh, like hormone that is how how we use glp1 receptor agonist to reduce not only the appetite from the central mechanism but also to delay gastric emptying so role of brain is very very important important in controlling appetite and actually it is homeostatic eating which is actually an eating for hunger which is mediated through glp1 receptor agonist glp1 um, hormone and pyy i already told you oxynotrone modulin and amylins are very very important because they increase satiety but i told you it is ghrelin which increases hunger so actually if we are simply going with the eating for hunger we may not get obese at all it is hedonic eating eating for pleasure which in spite of the fact that there is hardly any hunger and that we have a compulsive eating to get that pleasure out of that meal which induces obesity and we know here dopamine controls wanting the motivation the drive to eat so this is very very important and opioid and cannabinoid receptors i told you they control liking so if you have a drug which can address cannabinoid uh, receptors you may have still a check mechanism on dopamine like receptors induce wanting or over motivation or over drive to eat because then obviously there will be lesser pleasure associated with food but third important function of the brain in controlling appetite and to some extent in not getting obesity is executive function which decides that how much is the homeostatic eating pattern the real need for hunger to eat and how much is the hedonic eating which is an eating for pleasure so this executive function of the brain actually then takes that decision so this is deciding to eat 
when not to eat so it has to be a sum of feelings thoughts and behavior that is why it is said that behavioral interventions are going to be extremely important in management of obesity because they empower sustainable behaviors in controlling eating patterns so it may not be simply that you are not eating that true change in behavior will go a long way in sort of preventing obesity let me take you through now the etiopathogenesis of obesity as i already said it is an imbalance between an energy intake and energy expenditure unfortunately obesity has long been misunderstood it has been stigmatized as a lifestyle issue that can be simply effectively addressed by a mantra of eat less move more but i think it is much more than that now we understand that like any other chronic disease any other metabolic disorder like hypertension or dyslipidemia or coronary artery disease or maybe something like diabetes it has a heterogeneous condition it is, has a heterogeneous behavior resulting from the complex interaction of a multitude of social psycho biological factor that promote excessive weight gain and ultimately impair health so once obesity is established i think this is very very important to understand we tend to blame patient that you are eating more you are yeah, moving less yeah. but it is possibly because of the fact moment you have obesity that powerful neurohormonal factor effectively oh. defend body against weight loss this is what i heard uh, neeta talking about couple of times which was very very impressive that why don't we have a continuous weight loss on the same graph on a same program on a same structured exercise because in spite of the, all those programs going on that neurohormonal factors or that behavior will make sure that you don't lose weight further and this comes as a result of couple of inputs from gut genetics from medication and adipose tissue so it is the hedonic input i told you that pleasure eating which is very very important because once it is increased it gives you huge amount of pleasure in eating and you keep eating but much more than that even the environmental behavior is very very important that physical inactivity that inactive lifestyle moment you stop smoking unfortunately there is an increase in appetite you tend to gain weight and other psychosocial factors which are also equally important so when we talk about factors speed disposing to obesity it is not simply genetics which we know that there is a higher heritability of body weight there are genes in hypothalamus leptin melanocortin pathway which we have which i have just alluded to and single nucleotide polymorphism which predisposes to obesity so these snps there are almost more than 300 snps which have been identified with over 250 loci for which are associated with obesity traits which are very very important because they tend to regulate not only total bmi but they also there are loci or uh, almost 49 or 50 which tend to determine the waist hip ratio which is then subsequently expressed in adipose tissue so more than 100 genes and genetic loci are associated with obesity and genes are associated with bmi are enriched for expression in the brain and central nervous system so it is not much of peripheral response it is actually into the brain and into the central nervous system that these snps or genes predispose to obesity of course environmental factors are also very very important once it comes to predisposing to obesity like social cultural factors tradition beliefs and peer pressure to eat many mother in laws or mothers may insist you must eat socio economical factors food environment if you have a lot of availability of food obviously you are going to eat this what happens when you are on pleasure trips or in conferences and of course these days lot many fast foods are so inexpensive that and so palatable that it is difficult to control your weight or control yourself and we know with with the obesity there is going to be a uh, multiple complication like metabolic mechanical and mental metabolic could be simply in the form of having a uh, you may say asthma nephel gallstones because these are mechanical impact of obesity you may have osteoarthritis you might have pcods which we were just discussing and subsequent pregnancy complication and high risk of developing cancers as a metabolic effect and then you have mechanical effects like osc osteoarthritis and you are not able to walk you have a chronic back pain which makes you almost uh, hidden or uh, maybe on uh, no activity at all and of course mental results of obesity are also catastrophic in the form of depression and anxiety which comes as a 
result of obesity. So let's see, are there any benefits of weight loss? These are convincingly seen in all the evidences. Moment you have 5 to 10% weight loss, it will improve all obesity-related complication. May it be simply conversion from IGT to type 2 diabetes. There's significant reduction is going to be there in C mortality. Lipids are going to improve. Blood pressure is going to improve. And there are going to be improvement in obstructive sleep apnea scores. And overall health will definitely improve. But if you have a greater weight loss, more than 10 to 15% tailored data Right, Taylor data in the direct study has shown that you can have 15% weight loss in one year time. This may reverse or put diabetes into total remission because the moment you have more than 15% weight reduction, your disc glycemia disappears. Not only that, your triglycerides significantly improve and even your blood pressure also may get controlled. Of course, with 5 to 10%, there are going to be benefits. I told you reduction in effort score, sleep apnea will improve. Obviously, osteoarthritis will also go down and many other things will also get corrected. The problem is maintenance of weight loss is challenging. All these studies, these meta-analysis have shown it is easy to have weight loss, which may happen within six months with any sort of therapy. It may be a structured exercise program and couple of drugs. But unfortunately, down the line, if you follow these patients over the next four to five years, most of these patients, they regain the amount of weight loss what has happened. This is because of the fact that physiologically there are changes which are diet induced as a result of weight loss. There is going to be reduction in energy expenditure moment you have you are on the lesser calorie diet, fat oxidation goes down, even thyroid hormones get reduced, actually cortisol goes up and there is an increase in ghrelin and uh, overall appetite goes up moment you are say on very low calorie diet or VLCD type of thing. So not only your expenditure is going down, your appetite is coming up and that induces again that weight gain or at least what's your, your loss you try to gain. And there are going to be metabolic adoption following weight loss. This adoption resists that weight loss, which you have done maybe over six months or one year period. I told you this is primarily because of the fact that there is a reduction in satiety hormones with increased hunger hormones coming up like ghrelin, which tend to increase the weight whatsoever you have lost. And overall metabolism expenditure, I told you, goes down. And this is one of the biggest loser study reality show data, which is a six year follow -up. within 30 weeks. These patients lost weight and they were followed for a duration of six years. There was actually a reduction by 58 kg, minded 58 kg in 30 weeks time in these 16 patients. But unfortunately, within six years, they were almost back to the original weight and they gained almost 41 kg. Their resting metabolic rate, which was uh, minus by 610 calories, actually towards end of five years went down by minus 700 calories. So obviously, once your resting metabolic rate is going down or there are going to be metabolic adaption, these are going to again lead on to weight gain. So by six years, most of the participants, they demonstrated a metabolic adaption of almost 499 or 500 calories minus. So these data illustrate that metabolic adaptions, they counteract weight loss and it is going to persist over time. That is why subsequently you are going to gain the same weight what you initially lost. So to summarize, energy balance is regulated by brain through various sources of input. It has to be a meticulous balance between an energy intake and energy expenditure moment there is a imbalance in form of increased calories or lesser of physical activity you are going to gain weight the maintenance of weight loss is challenging due to metabolic adaption which i just alluded to because of reduction in satiety hormone but increase in hunger, hunger hormones and overall metabolism going down leading on to energy expenditure so brain controls appetite by regulating three types of eating it is homeostatic eating which is an appropriate eating for hunger. It is hedonic eating, which is inappropriate, which comes as a result of eating for pleasure. And it is an executive function of the brain, which decides what to eat and what not to eat. I'll stop short, short here and stop sharing here. And